Okay, so I'll talk to you to you later. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Ronaldo Menezes. I'm the co-chair of Complanet. Uh, it is really nice to actually have you join us on this online event. Uh, we, as you know, we we had a a really good plan to host a conference here in Exeter, but due to COVID, we that was not possible. So we decided to actually hold an online event and have the presentation of the papers that were published as part of a Springer. Uh, the lag proceedings. So this, this event is actually being done via Zoom, but broadcast live on YouTube. Um, and before I actually talk about some um, uh, um, just housekeeping uh, rules, I'd like to, of course, thank all the sponsors of the event uh, that include the Springer IOP Publishing, um, communications, physics, the Alan Turing Institute, the London Mathematical Society, and the institutes in Exeter, the Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, as well as the Global Systems Institute. This would not be possible really without the really hard work of all the program committee and the local organizers. I'm not going to read the name of everyone, but I really appreciate all the work that went through uh, in the last year. I have to also say that this event has been cancelled, but uh, it's kind of been, uh, in a sense, being postponed to next year. So what we decided to do in the organization is that next year, hopefully, um, we will be in a better situation. So the event is currently planned for, um, again, in Exeter on April 6 to April 9. And the website for that event will be uh, uh, up on the website as soon as the live event um, actually um, is done. So um, the program was prepared by the, uh, our program chairs, Hugo Barbosa, who's here, and Jesus Gomez Gardenias, who was not able to join us. But again, my big thanks to, to them for, for doing all the work as well as Bruno Gonçalves, who put together the, the publication of those papers. So we will actually have five sessions in this event. Um, and we try to, to accommodate the requests on the time that you wanted to present. So there was a survey sent. And as far as I can tell, everyone is presenting in a time that they said that they could present. So we have a first session that will start in a few minutes with four presentations. Uh, then we have a, a break for lunch. Um, and uh, we will have um, a session starting at 1.50, uh, then a, a session in the afternoon starting at 3.40 p.m. All right, so there are four papers now, four works. There will be four papers in the afternoon, and there will be four papers in the session uh, at the late afternoon. And we will have two tomorrow with three papers in the morning and uh, four papers in the afternoon. So what I'm asking people to do as just uh, some housekeeping rules is please uh, try to keep your video and microphone off for the Zoom participants. You probably cannot turn your, your sound on because I disabled that, uh, but you can probably turn your video on, uh, which there is no way for me to disable, but please do not try to keep that off so that it does not interfere with the presentation. Uh, the presentations. You can write your questions in the chat and the chair of the session, I will be chairing the first session, will kind of either read the question later to the speaker or enable the person to come in and ask the question directly if, if appropriately. Um, the speakers, if you are there, uh, you will soon, I uh, see that um, Batir just joined us so uh, they will soon be made co-hosts, which means that you'll be able to share the screen like Michele is doing right now. Uh, the speakers have 15 minutes, and then we will follow up with five minutes of questions. Right? Uh, there will be, of course, time for a handover between one speaker and another, but I will make sure that everybody gets their 15 minutes. And I do please ask the speakers in the session to uh, respect the time because there is somebody else that needs to present and we try to actually uh, stay within the parameters of, of the, the program at this point. Okay. 
So I appreciate you all being here again. So we will start in approximately uh, three, to five, uh, three to five minutes with the presentation called Group Cohesion Assessment in Networks. Uh, and it's being presented by Michele Malgheri uh, from University of Catania, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll be right back with you uh, in, in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much. So good morning again, Michele. I, um, if you're there, I think we we can start. Uh, if you able to unmute yourself, so Michele, I will try to keep track and of time, and I will probably come in very discreetly when you have five minutes left, and just say you have five minutes left, and again when you have one minute left. Thank you very much. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ronaldo. Good morning, everybody. So. I am Michael Malgeri from Catania University and the paper I'm going to present is titled The Group Cohesion Assessment in Network. The, this paper, uh, sorry, cohesiveness. So we try to introduce a new concept to the network, or really not to, uh, concept, uh, that times at measuring the coherence of the node belong to uh, a group or, uh, inside the network or, or several groups inside the network. The capability to measure coherence among group, either in natural present or imposed by external uh, construction, it is a, a very important problem in various domains, such as a trust network. We will use in the experiment in this paper that uh, is at the end of this presentation the trust domain, but the property is quite general and can be simply applied to any uh, network that can describe it by the direct graph. So, some motivation about, uh, 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 about the proposal. Uh, we start from a metric that we introduced in the paper that is uh, that you can see in the bottom of the, the slide that uh, was titled Overcoming the Page Rating Normalization Problem. In that work, we proposed to solve the problem of normalization of page rank by inserting one special node, a box node, that we call the black hole, uh, since uh, it collects all uh, um, values as black hole uh, do with light, and adding a weight transformation that keeps network adjacent matrix stochastics in order to uh, apply regular matrix uh, based on that uh, properties. That uh, the transformation 
uh, of the weights of the arc that originated from any node allow us to solve the normalization problem, but it does not preserve the outstrength of the node. So our goal was to maintain the difference between the absolute value that in some sort of way was hidden by the page rank. Therefore, we added this node and uh, make it able to absorb the lack of uh, outstrength, thus guaranteeing that the sum is always equal to one. And uh, this means that the, uh, every node will be connected to black hole with a strength of one minus s con i. This is the uh, formally expression of the black hole matrix. So uh, if we have a generic uh, node E and in enter the interval of value that uh, cover the output of uh, this node, we can express the uh, value with this formula. You can see that uh, this, this value express that the arc going from i to j is uh, uh, in some sort of way related to the, the original value her i j but it is uh, normalized with respect to the uh, extreme values of the interval in which it is uh, defined then we can also uh, calculate the contribute of the value absorbed by the black hole in this uh, is something like a sort of complement of value we have to guarantee that the sum is uh, will be one so we have to add the contribute that make all uh, this formula valid so the, this formula the B on I, let uh, us permit uh, to have a correct value at the end of the calculation of the stochastic matrix. What is, in general, the meaning of the arc? Of course, it depends on the network being studied. For instance, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, it could be the number of data exchanged. In a power grid, it could represent the amount of energy transmitted. And in a social network, it is often the trust a person assigned to his neighbors. We performed the experiment using a free famous network. However, the proposed measure is generally and can be applied to any scenario described by a weighted network. Sorry, I am. What we observed that the uh, rank of the black hole only depend on how much the source nodes trust their respective neighbors. It means that the higher is the page rank value of black hole, the lower is the confidence in neighbors. So we want to define some uh, way to use these uh, uh, characteristics uh, to measure how much the node have uh, cohesiveness with their uh, related to the acquaintance or some uh, any other nodes. In order to do it, we have to extend the matrix. Uh, having just one uh, black hole, we can measure just the global properties of the network. But if we want to uh, study the group coherence, uh, uh, we, we add uh, several black hole and we use the absorbed strength as a measure of cohesiveness. Then, based on this reasoning, the, uh, we define cohesiveness among groups as the value of page rank of the black hole pointed by the node inside the groups. 
cohesiveness ranges over zero to one, and the values close to ones means higher confidence. Just a little recall. This is the definition, formal definition of the cohesiveness. So uh, let us G a weighted direct network and P a partition in G groups according to some properties of the networks, we introduce G black hole to ensure the internal coherence of groups, one black hole for each group, and G times G minus one to measure external coherence, one black hole for each couple of groups. So what we see is something like a new network with several nodes that collect the exceeding values starting from node that we will use to calculate the cohesiveness. So the generic black hole point, but that there's the node of group G, uh, GP, trusting node of the group GQ, is represented by the formula that you can see in the, uh, in the picture. The contribute of each node is given by this formula where you have these terms that the terms R E J that is the uh, original value that was uh, in, uh, normalized with respect to the lower and the higher value that he can assume. Since uh, this value is uh, uh, more, uh, this value uh, not, uh, does not correspond to our idea, we prefer to uh, use this uh, formula. The cohesiveness is defined as the complement to one of the page rank value of the black hole connected to the group normalized with the respect to the fraction not defined to it in order to guarantee that the higher is uh, cohesiveness, higher is the confidence, is just a way of formula. In the following picture, you can see a representation of a toy example where we have just the group and the related black hole. Each, uh, we have four black hole. Two will uh, are used to uh, measure the internal cohesiveness. What uh, this means, uh, you can see this is uh, the lower left B11. It collects all the exceeding values of the node of group G1 that is related to the node belonging to the same group. So we will need, as I explained before, just as black hole as the group has. What is to study and characterize cohesiveness, we uh, applied this property and studied some uh, evidence in three famous data set, Advocado Trust Network, Friendship Data college and Bitcoin Alpha Trust Temporal Network. The former is a static trust network of developers, um, Friendship Dutch College and Bitcoin Alpha Trust are both temporal, so we can also study something uh, related to the evolution of time of the properties. Moreover, since uh, this uh, group uh, have no uh, group partition uh, external imposed, uh, we decided to use uh, as uh, uh, partitioning uh, the communities existing inside this network. So 
before to uh, start the experiment, uh, we uh, did a search for community and used them as group. Let me know. Michele, you have five minutes left. Okay, perfect. Let me note that the use of community is not required by metric, but that was just a choice to perform the experiment. This uh, first figure show the analysis of the advocato data set. We find 26 communities. Uh, each square show the cohesion where the dark square is, the lower cohesion is. You can see that we have a lot of diagram that is uh, white. It means that there is no relation with, uh, among that group. But, uh, you, and uh, you can also see that the diagonal represent, of course, the internal cohesion. It's uh, quite expected that the internal cohesion is higher. And uh, just looking at this picture, you can see that in general, the cohesion uh, of uh, advocado communities is, is uh, quite hard, and uh, we expected this result since this is uh, a community of developers that uh, are quite close to between them, uh, among them. One other result we experimented, we looked, uh, investigated if uh, what is the correlation between the intra and intergraph co cohesion. So this uh, picture show us uh, the two values. You can see in the left picture the in, that intergroup cohesion is uh, quite high, while the intergroup cohesion is distributed in a wider range. Uh, so in general, we can see that in Advocato, smaller group exhibit a wide range of internal cohesion values, so while larger group generally have a higher internal cohesion. It's quite expected also we, uh, see, uh, due to the characteristic of this uh, network. This figure uh, show the uh, evolution of in Bitcoin, Bitcoin Alpha Network is quite different with the other. We show two different things. The color in the upper part of the picture represent the evolution of time. And we can see that the intergroup cohesion is quite stable either in uh, time and in the position. The majority of group is a bit an aggregate internal cohesion, no? while the intergroup cohesion is a high only for low medium size of the group. That is quite a bit different with respect to Advocato. The lower part of figure is just the average of the values over the time that we analyzed. We performed also a representation of the evolution of time. Also, this figure is related to Bitcoin Alpha Network, but we didn't find uh, any meaning pattern. So you can see the violet or orange curve is quite variable in the time. So to conclude, in this work, uh, we introduced a, no, a new property that we call the cohesiveness, uh, and we reported its origin, its motivation, and its formal definition. We considered three different real world scenarios and discussed the relevant results uh, in order to understand if uh, the cohesiveness is a significant property of the network. We believe that. Uh, cohesiveness appear an interesting proter, uh, properties, but the further study must be devoted to investigate the role of groups in the uh, world network, in the real world network. So we have in mind to extend the characterization to other network and uh, study of its related to the uh, form and way the group is created. Thank you for attention. Feel free to ask everyone everything. Thank you, Michele. Thank you for the presentation and for, for being on time. Uh, um, I 
I ask people to, if they want, they could raise their hand or, or type questions on YouTube. So I'm kind of uh, um, paying attention to that. But I will start with, uh, with a couple of questions, Michele, and see if uh, people actually have more. So um, I was a little confused when you said that the, the way you need to define one black hole per group, right? But in your example, in the figure, it, um, it is, you have actually flop four black holes in yes. two groups. And, and I'm also curious how those black holes, and I know that that's a previous work, but how do you define who they connect to? Okay, uh, we, uh, why we have uh, four uh, uh, black nodes? A, a couple is related to internal cohesiveness. So we need just one black hole for each group. In this case, this black hole collect all the uh, exceeding values that is uh, related to node only node inside the group. So for instance, if you look at the uh, lower left, you can see only arrows starting from node inside the group. And uh, it is related to the uh, value, uh, uh, the page, the black hole value that is related to the confidence of the, a node inside the group to a node, a, another node inside the group. So we have just one for this group and another one for the group two. Now we also want to study the interrelation. So we need one node that is related to the connection between nodes uh, in group one, starting from node in group one and ending on group two, in group two. But since this is a weight network, we have different, uh, the network is not symmetric. So we need a black hole that uh, uh, models the uh, values uh, of the arc starting from uh, nodes inside the group one, uh, group one and ending in group two, in group two, and another no black hole that model the values, the arcs starting from group two and ending in group one. So in this case, we need a couple of nodes to model the interrelation. And in general, if we have G groups, we need G times G minus one uh, black node to model the interrelation between groups. All right, I understand. So, so my other question, Michele, it's related to, well, it's, it's actually a, a two-part question, right? So one is that um, you're proposing this new metric, but there are other metrics in networks that somewhat capture how tightly connected um, groups are. And have you done any experiment just to look at the correlations between what you're proposing and some other metric that just to ensure that we don't have yet another metric that perhaps overlaps a lot with, with something that already exists. Okay, uh, I start from your second question. Uh, uh, yes, it is uh, just a, a modification of the general definition of the previous matrix, but it's quite the same from the general point of view because uh, uh, we can easily add no, a black hole without changing the reason and the result of the black hole matrix. So the reason why we had more black hole is just a study of we can use them uh, to um, extract some properties of the, uh, from, from the network. So uh, you, are, you are right, uh, it's quite the same matrix, but we use a different uh, way to uh, define the black holes. Instead, to use just one, we use uh, the, the number that is related to the group. Uh, so in this, uh, in this case, we use them and put them in order to uh, model the existing group, if it is possible to define group, of course. Uh, so about the um, 
first question. I am not sure to have uh, understood the, what you mean. Oh, so, so actually, the, the, that you answered my question. I had okay. another, uh, the, the second part I actually I didn't say, which was to do that you, you have the inter and intra um, yes. group. And I was wondering if this could be coupled with some sort of optimization process where you naturally find the groups that minimizes the intro maybe uh, could be interesting mm -hmm. of course uh, uh, we can uh, use these properties in order to try to optimize group to find them but in this work we just uh, find something that we can uh, with uh, uh, allow us to define to divide in groups so that is uh, connected to the uh, network in order to avoid to uh, impose from external any division that could bias the result just it uh, uh, i previous responded to a, a question on the chat is very yes uh, this black node is a sort of uh, or sync but it collects the difference between the value uh, that is uh, uh, the weight that is in the arc in order to avoid that a very uh, uh, lower value is uh, in the page rank provided the same uh, result of a uh, higher value when all arcs has the same value just to simplify with this Okay, so Michele, we we running out of time. Really nice presentation. I appreciate. I guess we don't have a way to to clap here, but I'm I'm sure people appreciated the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for participating. I will ask you to please stop sharing your screen, and we will move to the presentation of uh, Miguel Martins, who should be okay, online. Thank you much. I I believe. Uh, Miguel, you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, Hello, good morning. Good morning, Miguel. So um, if you can try to share your screen. And yeah, then, yeah. Um, so you should be able to do that uh, because I put you as, as co-host of the session. Um, okay. Just and moment, there was please. a there was a request uh, for people, and I'm sorry, Michele, that I didn't say this. That although I ask people to stay with their camera off, so I'm actually going to put my my camera on here, so uh -huh. that they would probably connect better to the speaker if you are comfortable sharing your video. All right. So if you okay doing that, it's up entirely up to the speakers. So mm -hmm. if you are comfortable doing that, uh, uh, Miguel. Please do if you if you're not comfortable, it's okay as well. Okay. Okay. So hopefully you can see my screen. Like we can see your screen and you can see uh, yourself as well. Okay. Good. So, so Miguel, good. so 15 minutes followed All by right. uh, five minutes of questions. And um, thanks for being here. Floor All is right. Here. My pleasure. So good morning, everyone. So I'm Miguel Martins. Uh, my co-author uh, is Professor Pedro Ribeiro. Uh, I'm here to present you a new framework, which is called Condensed Graphs. And its main purpose is to accelerate subgraph census computation. So um, as you probably uh, know, uh, modern network analysis is really tied to this um, uh, pattern matching uh, of uh, subgraphs on a given network. Uh, and uh, we decided to focus uh, on what we call the subgraph census problem, which is basically how can one uh, calculate uh, and determine all the frequencies of a given subgraph. So uh, very briefly, the subgraph census problem is given a graph G and some subgraph, uh, say a tree subgraph of size three, uh, one should enumerate um, only once and exactly once uh, all induced occurrences uh, of that subgraph on graph G. Uh, that means that um, all vertices uh, should have uh, their edges uh, that are shared amongst them uh, enumerated. So um, this is a very simple example uh, just to get some visual intuition of the problem. Um, a quick walk through some, um, through some uh, application examples. Um, if one tries to compute uh, on directed graphs, uh, the triad significance profile, one can cluster um, different types of phenomena uh, like language, uh, social, and uh, web crawling networks, 
um, of course, uh, also protein transaction net networks, and they cluster very, very neatly uh, using uh, this uh, technique. Um, another thing that I want to point to uh, as a kind of a visual intuition uh, is first how the subgraphs growing um, in number uh, as k goes, uh, grows larger. Uh, so, for instance, if you see all the four subgraphs, uh, the five subgraphs, uh, the, 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 the set is um, quite larger. Uh, also, uh, I would like to convey this intuition of uh, automorphism uh, orbits with capture, which capture uh, local information about um, the vertices, uh, topological information. So uh, basically, uh, subgraph census was, has been studied for quite a while. Um, the, maybe the first uh, more eloquent uh, and elegant uh, approach to this algorithm, to this problem, was ASU. So it means uh, enumerating subgraphs, uh, which has basically two very simple but very clever symmetry breaking conditions that allows one to build a really nice recursion tree where the, all the valid enumerations uh, are. Uh, exactly enumerated once. Um, so as the um, literature uh, progressed, it became obvious that uh, we need to, of course, perform um, isomorphic tests, and that uh, takes some computational effort. So basically, um, if you think about exhaustive search um, uh, or optimized uh, exhaustive search algorithms like Quantel, Xero, and Phase, um, which use uh, substructures, uh, data structures um, uh, that capture um, um, already pre-computed um, frequencies. And basically the intuition is that uh, should you account for uh, a given topology, um, you only need to perform the subgraph isomorphism test once. Uh, of course, phase and one like zero, I believe, don't, they don't guarantee this, that this is always happens. Uh, there are algorithms such as g that uh, guarantee that uh, that only happens once, uh, but they uh, rely on a very intricate set of uh, conditions and a set of uh, subgraphs uh, in order to enumerate the series. So um, on the more analytical or mathematical approaches, uh, we have algorithms like Quarka, uh, which basically target very specific domain um, graphs uh, up to a given size. For instance, Orca, I believe uh, it targets all un undirected subgraphs to up to a size five very efficiently with a set of linear equations. <clears throat> uh, this is really nice uh, for highly specialized fields, but if you want complete generality and if you want to have the complete coverage uh, for all k or for a large value of k uh, that is computable, uh, of course, you lose a little bit on that sense. So our main goal is basically combine uh, some uh, a priori knowledge of some topo topological structures and use that knowledge uh, on a traditional um, enumeration algorithm. Uh, so basically, um, we decided as a proof of concept to um, target what we call peripheral stars. Uh, if you're familiarized with the concept of a claw, it should be uh, it should become easier to you, but I will explain it very fast. So basically, um, peripheral vertices, we define them as vertices which, has, which have exactly one neighbor, okay? And basically this neighbor, which we call the seed vertex, um, if you think, if you, uh, imagine that you will remove it from the network. Basically, we will have an independent an independent set of the peripheral vertices and the rest of the network. Uh, so basically, uh, if it's not hard to, uh, to to imagine that such a simple topology, uh, regardless of the labels, we uh, to, in order to compute the frequency, one only needs to um, since the, well, I apologize since the isomorphic class is always the same. Um, for instance, if we want decide to take two of these uh, peripheral vertices, um, it, you only need to perform the um, binomial coefficient uh, with k equals two, or the combinations of um, on this on this case three uh, two, uh, in order to um, perform um, and get the, the accurate result for the frequencies, since the the, um, the topological information is so simple. So basically, what we did is we created this data structure, which is a condensed graph. Uh, so basically, we take all the peripheral vertices and we save them on a lookup list uh, pertaining to each uh, verti vertex. Um, we also made sure that the label um, order is kept intact. So uh, as you can see, for instance, here we have three peripheral vertices, uh, which are saved here as three. 
and for instance here on vertex X, uh, 8 uh, it gets mapped to 3 we get 0 so basically um, in order to extract the frequencies uh, it becomes really trivial after you have this uh, intermediate representation so basically um, if you're trying to for instance for the subgraph which is already on the condensed state and it has five peripheral vertices on the vertex level 3 um, if you don't want to uh, enumerate any uh, peripheral vertices, uh, of course, you account for zero, and the binomial coefficient is defined here. Uh, it outputs one by default. Um, of course, if you go to four subgraphs, you would need to take one from here. So there are five possible vertices, and of course, that um, multiplies the frequency of this subgraph by five. Uh, and this follows for, of course, if you want to take two, you take the, the five peripheral vertices and you do the combinations two by two. Uh, and this goes on uh, until five, of course. Uh, so basically, the, our, we build this condensation, the condensation framework, and we use this very simple topology just as a proof of concept. Uh, here, S key of U um, represents uh, this array over here. So um, the, one of the, the main innovation here is that typically, Enumeration algorithms, uh, they only add frequencies, uh, um, they only add one in the frequency. So it, they only enumerate one uh, uh, subgraph per uh, recursion branch. Here we can um, uh, extract several frequencies given this uh, topological knowledge. So the only thing we need to do is, uh, okay, we have a valid uh, enumeration or partial enumeration. We need to know how many vertices one can enumerate. So this is the minimum of the number of uh, available positions we have on the partial uh, enumeration set and the size of our um, seed vertex or peripheral star. So after that, we can extract trivially the, the, the labels. And basically, um, as I explained before, we just we just update the, the current frequency by multiplying each of the um, um, each of the of the partial frequencies by the appropriate binomial coefficient. Uh, just um, a set of um, uh, intuition uh, about the binomial function or binomial coefficients. Of course, this is a discrete function, but for just for clarity, uh, we plot it as a continuous one. Uh, basically, the optimum value for k. Uh, it's always at n over 2. So for instance, here we have the binomial function uh, for with um, the upper index of uh, 100. Uh, at, if we uh, analyze the, the gradient, one can see that um, there's really uh, this high and steep um, uh, increase uh, on the number uh, of the binomial coefficient. So it means that uh, as we get closer to the maxima, uh, we get um, exponential benefits in a sense. Uh, this is, if you look uh, uh, here, uh, as the maximum grows, if you take the value that maximizes the binomial function, so every k, we can see if we plot the log, the log on a log scale, the, bin, the, bin, the binomial function for uh, several values of n, uh, we can see uh, that um, this value also is uh, exponential. So on a log scale, it takes uh, a single line. So uh, here I just present a subset of um, of our results. The rest are, are on the paper. Uh, P of G basically the, denotes the number of peripheral vertices we have on the graph. The compression ratio is essentially um, the size of the condensed graph, uh, the, the ratio between the size of the condensed graph with the original graph. Uh, we don't ac account for peripheries of size one because they don't they don't bring any benefits. And um, as a lower uh, bound of performance, we also uh, took the measure of the maximum star that we found. Um, so um, basically here, uh, we decided to adapt uh, two algorithms. So phase is a more state-of-the-art algorithm, uh, more robust. And e ESU is basically the classical, traditional, and elegant uh, exhaustive search algorithm with symmetry breaking conditions. Um, as one can see, like the, the trend uh, for each network, of, co of course, as the size of the network varies, one can measure it for different values of k, is that as k grows up, or uh, the higher, uh, the bigger the patterns we look for are, uh, the bigger the performance gain is. Uh, that's the overall trend. And moreover, um, if, you, if you think about it, phase already uh, saves a lot of computational effort um, on saving some um, time performing these tests, but our condensed version of FESU, which doesn't have um, um, this uh, sophisticated data structure in it, uh, already outperforms the vanilla phase uh, for a lot of these networks. 
And for instance, uh, if you go back here, of course, these are really good. Um, uh, they have really high compression ratios. But if we go to the this biological network, uh, which only has about 50%, uh, we can see that um, first it's a smaller network, so we can uh, get closer to the maxima of the binomial co coefficient. And you can see that um, the speed up tends to grow uh, super linear, which is really good. Uh, we also wanted to see how uh, synthetic models um, So I believe we lost uh, Miguel. I don't know if uh, someone on the chat can tell me if uh, this is just for me. So unfortunately we lost Miguel, um, so the we hopefully he will try to to rejoin. So if you're joining us now, I mean we. Um, we lost uh, Miguel Martins on his presentation. I'm going to wait uh, a minute or so to see if he comes back and um, see if we can resume from where from where he started. So I wonder, um, I'm going to ask if Hugo could try to contact Miguel, maybe offline. Um, I'm sure that there's an email. Then just say that he may have to disconnect and connect again, because I don't, um, I don't see a way that I can actually remove him. He may not even notice that we cannot. Uh, yeah, let, me, let right. me reach out to him in just a second. So in the meantime, uh, our next presenter is Batir. Batir, you should be able to unmute yourself. Um, and yeah, okay. So just, just testing, so very, very good. We will uh, go back to you. So we will wait um, a couple of minutes, a minute or so to see if Miguel comes back. Because um, I still, actually he's no longer in the list. Um, so it means that he may have noticed that um, that he was not uh, being heard. And I'll go back to you in a few minutes, Bati. Sure.
Okay, so so let's let's continue with the presentations and Hugo. Later on, I can talk to you um, um, and see if you manage to actually get in contact with Miguel. We can try to give him some time at the end of the session. Okay, so to continue his presentation, it is unfortunate, but it is um, something that we foresee happening because uh, that's what happens when you have an online event. So, but here, so could you try to share your screen, please? Yes, perfect. Um, and we can see you as well. So I'll stop my video. Thank you for being here, Batia. So are you, I mean, are you actually in Nevada right now? Uh, I'm actually in Atlanta right now for summer. <laughs> okay, so, so no, good. Early I was morning here. It was going to be pretty early for you. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't uh, check time when I... Uh, so, so, but yeah, um, so, um, you have 15 minutes. Uh, I will actually come in when you have five minutes left and just say you have five minutes left. And then again, when you have one minute left. Okay. But uh, I will try to not interrupt you. You're just going to come in and say five minutes left. Okay, sure. Uh, do you want me to start? Yes, please start. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So hello, everyone. I am Bater Sharif from Stevens Institute of Technology. And uh, today I would like to present our work on complex network analysis of United States air transportation. So let me start our presentation. As you know, United States air transportation is a huge system with a lot of airports involved with many employees and with uh, passing, average passengers boarded each year reaching 800 million and with total revenue nearly equal to 200 billion. So in our work, we try to analyze, a comp we try to make complex network analysis of this complex system. So there exist uh, prior studies uh, which analyze the worldwide air transportation network in terms of centrality community and the, they show that uh, worldwide air transportation network is a scale free small world network. There exists studies related to the Chinese air transportation network uh, which analyze uh, its, if, uh, their correlation with the country's GDP and uh, analyze its topological structure there exist uh, studies on European aviation network, uh, which uh, tries to analyze effect of the deregulation on uh, topological structure of the network and the resilience of the random flight uh, failures in passenger street scheduling. And also there exist studies on the United States air transportation network focusing on different periods. And uh, our study is inspired uh, by the study from Mark et al, which focuses on the periods 19 to 2000. So in our work, uh, we use the data set from the U US Department of Transportation, specifically we focused on the data set between 2007 and 2016. The data set provides information like airport code and the uh, city code, state code, which we use it as a node type uh, to aggregate the network in different levels like airport, city and state. We also uh, the data set also provides the uh, information about number of passengers, total freight carried, and the number of flights between two nodes, which we employed as a uh, edge weight information. And uh, so basically we generate the network uh, in which node types are represented with the airport, city, and state. And the uh, edge weight is represented with the number of passengers and the uh, freight carried and the number of flights. So we create the network like this. Then we try to analyze the uh, first list try to analyze the static network uh, behaviors. Like we observed that nodes and edges sharply decrease in 2008 and 2013. We observed larger flights preferred over smaller flights to increase the number of passengers uh, as we observed that uh, uh, average weight degree of the passenger network uh, increases whereas average weight degree of the flight network uh, decreases. We also observe uh, small world characteristics across each abstraction in airport level and city and state level. We observed uh, passenger network at airport level becomes more centralized over time as density and the clustering coefficients has downward trend with the time. So we also observed the exponential degree distributions as you can see from the figures uh, complementary cumulative distributive function and the probability distribution function. We observed uh, it has the exponential degree distribution. 
then we try to analyze the network dynamics. Uh, we first start with the node and edge activity. Here, activity means uh, how long uh, does a specific node or specific edge between two nodes remains active in a network. So we observed that most of the nodes uh, in each abstraction, city, airport, and state level, they remain active. Uh, I think it's expected. Um, as uh, there, it's expected that there will be some flight in from if there exists airport, there will be some flight in each year, right? So uh, they remain most of the time active. But for the edges, uh, we observe that most of the edges are active or inactive for the short period of the time. And uh, we also observe that uh, there exist a large number of edges uh, which are continuously active during the 10 periods, uh, 10 year period. So these edges might be between large cities or between major airports. So then we continue uh, to analyze the appearance and the disappearance of the edges uh, in terms of their weight. Uh, it will show us if there is a correlation between the stability of the link and its weight. So to do that, we try to use uh, fraction of appearance and disappearance. Uh, fraction of appearance is computed by uh, the, uh, computing the number of links with uh, weight W, which are not active at time T1, divided by the number of links with weight W at time T. So fraction of appearance and disappearance will show us uh, if there's a correlation between the weight stabi uh, weight of the link and its uh, stability. So overall, we observed that uh, fraction of appearance and disappearance decreases as link weight increases. Uh, this means that uh, higher uh, edges with higher weight uh, are more stable. Uh, they, uh, they are more stable in a network. If they are observed in previous years, they are most likely to be observed in this year too. For example, for flight uh, network at airport level, uh, we see downward trend basically as weight increases, uh, the fraction of appearance and disappearance decreases, meaning that uh, this uh, edge with this weight are becoming more stable. For freight network, uh, we observe a similar pattern, but uh, there exist very large weights uh, which are not stable, but however, probability of observing such uh, weights are low. This might be due to some econo economical reasons. Uh, for passengers network, uh, we see that as weight increases, uh, the fraction of appearance and disappearance decreases, meaning that more stable. I think it's reasonable because uh, if the number of passengers in a given flight, there, if there is a lot of passengers for a given flight, it will it, it's more it will be more stable, right? Why will someone cancel or reschedule that flight, right? So then we try to analyze how uh, edge weight uh, grows uh, once an uh, edge becomes an active, how its weight changes. So to do that, we use a uh, growth weight function and uh, we observe that uh, for most of the weights, uh, for most of the edges, uh, once they are becoming uh, active, their weight increments are small. But we also observe that there exists sudden large increase in or decrease in weight of the edges uh, with uh, non-negligible probability. We can observe such uh, links with non-negligible probability. So we observed uh, similar behavior for the other abstraction levels like city and state level. And the uh, previous studies that focus on uh, data between 19 to 2000, uh, they also observed the similar behaviors in their analysis. So then we analyze the network backbone. And to do that, we use a disparity filter. We basically generate the network backbone for each network in each year. And we try to compute their overlap by using the, by dividing the intersection of edges with the union of the edges. Uh, for two consecutive or for two uh, backbones. Then uh, for city and the airport level, we observed that uh, the overlap is usually, is most of the time uh, high. But for state level, we observed that uh, when we put it to color coded matrix, we observed that there exist distinct uh, partitions in, in, in 10 year period. Uh, for example, as you can see from the, from the 
flight network in state level, the le leftmost figure. We can see that uh, color coded matrix is divided into two partitions from 2007 to 2011 and from 2012 to 2016. And the, the, the network backbones in each partitions are more similar within each other and more dissimilar with the network backbone from another partition. So we think that during the 2011, uh, from 2011 to 2012, there might, uh, ha might happen uh, some infrastructure change, uh, which impacts the network, uh, which make, uh, may have an impact, enduring impact on the network backbone. Similar observations were ob observed for freight network, uh, as you can see in 2008 to 2009, for passengers network from in 2012 to 2013. So we tried to analyze uh, the net uh, centralities of the nodes in, during that period. For example, for flight network, we said that uh, network backbone changed uh, from 2011 to 2012. And uh, we tried to analyze how centralities of the uh, nodes uh, change, ranking of the centrality of the nodes changed during that period. This is a degree centrality for flight network. We can see that uh, the uh, degree centrality of the California and the New York uh, decreases, uh, degree centrality of the Texas increases during that period. Uh, we, we also see that uh, degree centrality of the of, uh, Tennessee also decreases a little bit. Uh, when we look at the freight network, we observe that uh, degree centrality of the Georgia drop drops and uh, degree centrality for Kentucky also drops and the degree centrality for California increases. And for passengers network, uh, we observed that California's degree centrality drops for Florida degree centrality increases for Michigan degree centrality drops. So uh, this is a, this can be further explored to understand uh, what might happen in during those periods which uh, lead to the network backbone change. So this is uh, open to further investigation. Five so minutes, please. Okay, <laughs> I'm almost done. So to conclude, uh, we tried to analyze complex network of United States aid transportation from 2007 to 2016. We observed that it has small world network characteristics with uh, exponential degree distribution. Most of the links are continuously active or inactive for short periods of the time. Stability of the links increases as their weight increases usually. And uh, once links are active, weight increments and decrements are small. And there exist distinct periods in which uh, backbone of the network in each abstraction level changes drastically. So this is the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer your questions. And uh, thank you for attending our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Batu. Thank you for, for the presentation. Um, uh, I Again, I'm monitoring the, the questions here online. So let me start with, uh, of course, you, you, you managed to find those um, sudden changes, but do you know why they happen, right? So, okay, one thing is to say that they happen and obviously they, they seem to happen, but what, yeah. what actually leads to this? So, uh... Actually, we don't know what happened and uh, we are trying to further analyze uh, what might cause it to these changes. We started with the, uh, central, analyzing the centralities of the nodes uh, in the, uh, like be between this and the degree centrality weight and weight, average weight degree centralities, uh, page ranks. And uh, we try to analyze those uh, things to, f to further, uh, for example, to if, if we observe that California's degree centrality drops sharply, what might cause it uh, for degree centrality to drop sharply in that year specific year? What happened? In does is there another airport opened, or is there I don't know uh, some kind of rules that come up uh, that uh, lead to the change of the backbones? So we try to analyze. Uh, uh, we are trying to analyze uh, such things uh, in our extended version of this paper. So, so um, one thing that I would suggest is that it may be possible for you to actually locate specific events that are important for, for the airline network, for instance, that in the opening of an airport, as you said, or a company that established a hub 
And once you know the ground truth, right, and because you know what actually happened, then you can see if this is somewhat um, reflected in, in your analysis. Uh, yeah. So a lot of times, like, I don't know, American Airlines may change their hub from one place to another place, or a new airline comes in. So. Yeah, it, exactly. We are looking, we are trying to analyze some such things, and uh, thank you for the suggestion. One, one final question. Another question, but comment is also: Do you think you you'll be able to get data uh, from this period, I guess, of COVID? Because I mean, as you know, the airline industry changed a lot, right? And yeah. I, I was wondering if, I mean, my, yeah. my my intuition is that the freight network probably did not change as much as yeah. the the airline. So it would be interesting to see the robustness of certain locations. Um, in, during the, those times, yeah, that's in, in, interesting uh, uh, view. I, I mean, of course, I, I, I haven't checked yet that their United States air transportation website, but uh, I will uh, I will definitely check it uh, if there is an available data set for this year uh, and uh, to further extend uh, this research. I will definitely look at it. All right, thank you very much. So, so there thank were no you. other questions there. So, but yeah, appreciate you coming here. So, I have asked you to please um, um, stop sharing your screen, and we will bring back uh, Miguel Martins. Uh, so, as soon as you you stop, hello, hey Miguel. So let's uh, try. It's, to, <laughs> it, it, it's okay. So you should be able to to share uh, and. Uh, I'm sorry that you you finished your presentation and you didn't hear anybody. So if you, I can, you can probably go back. I don't know um, where I, I was. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know where. You, I you were there. You were in this one. Where yeah. you were talking? Yes. I mean, okay. that's okay. Okay. So uh, first of all, this was a problem on, on my ISP here in Portugal, North. My apologies. Uh, so I'll continue. So uh, basically, uh, um, as you know, we are taking advantage of the um, binomial uh, coefficients. And just to get gather some intuition, um, basically, uh, if you plot the, um, the binomial function, uh, one can see that uh, the, the values, um, the maxima for the, the, the binomial function is always at n over 2. So for instance, on this example, uh, with, 100, uh, with, a, with a parameter of 100 on n, um, k uh, as a maximum on 50. Uh, of course, this is a discrete function, it's just for clarity. And um, just if you look at the gradient, there's a high steep degree uh, increase here. So as we get closer to the maximum, uh, of uh, one can get um, higher and higher benefits. Uh, another piece of intuition: if uh, if you plot uh, to the, bin the binomial function uh, in uh, with n and k parameters uh, for um, uh, several intervals, and you max you take the value of k that maximizes it, uh, you see that actually the value of the function is exponential, uh, since on the uh, logarithmic scale, it follows the line. So basically, there's a lot of gain uh, to get should we encounter a, a good um, peripheral star. Uh, so basically, um, this uh, this is a subset of the results we have on the paper. Um, basically, uh, P of G denotes the peripheral vertices, um, and the compression ratio is basically the size of the condensed graph, uh, the, the ratio of the size of the original graph with the condensed one. And here we don't account for peripheries of size one because they don't bring any computational benefits. Uh, so it's really um, um, a decent estimation uh, of the compression uh, we get. Um, and basically, the maximum star, uh, if you think about this, is like a lower bound uh, uh, of the performance gain one can get uh, if we only to think uh, of the max maximum star. Uh, so basically, there are two trends uh, basically that you can identify. First, I should clarify that we uh, compare uh, our framework. Uh, we use ESU and we apply our framework here, and phase, which is a, a more sophisticated state-of-the-art algorithm, uh, and we apply uh, our condensation framework on top. So the first trend we can see is that uh, if we compare the same algorithm to the condensed version, is that um, the trend tends to uh, be uh, increase with k, so this follows a little bit of our intuition, as k goes high, higher, uh, the speed up should increase, uh, so this is 
on face this really uh, shows up uh, of course on social networks as the retweet uh, network of obama and the facebook uh, sample um, one can expect influencers to emerge and so on uh, but for instance um, in uh, fiber tract um, brain fiber tracts networks uh, although the the compression ratio is higher uh, the stars are not so big and uh, the speed up is not as um, as pronounced but it's still um, quite high so uh, just to you can see here we have five orders of magnitude here we can manage three and even on gene fusion uh, which is basically a gene interaction network network where the compression ratio was only about 50 percent um we can see that um the speed up uh, sk uh, tends to the maxima um, of course it gets better also a really neat um, result we got is that sometimes you know eso is really uh, slower than phase by default but our condensed version of eso also uh, outperforms by quite a while by um, uh, phase uh, vanilla phase so that's another interesting idea that the bulk of the computation computational uh, effort is saved uh, for these networks um, under um, our framework cannot not the sophisticated cheat writers of face, uh, which is which already cover a lot of corner cases. So this was a very good result and surprises, surprised us. So uh, it's always good to have synthetic models just to validate a little bit the results. Uh, we experimented with uh, Barabazzi Albert models uh, for skill free networks, uh, all of them with a thousand uh, nodes and um, we also um, use home scheme model uh, where P models the probability of a, a, a vertex at timestamp T on the graph evolution uh, forming a, a, a triangle. Uh, thus, uh, one can control um, the clustering coefficient. So the idea here, uh, here we set P to 0 0.9, so 90% probability. Um, the higher the P, the higher the clustering coefficient will be, uh, the less beneficial it will be to have a condensation paradigm there. So we have also our best case, the random power law tree uh, generated model. Um, the, the most important thing here is the gamma, which is the parameter of the power law distribution. And it's basically a random K tree. So you can imagine that um, a lot of peripheries should emerge um, on this uh, model. So, so for scale three, uh, three minutes. Mm -hmm. okay. Three minutes, okay, I'm really finishing. So basically the results, um, they are in compliance with what we found on the real ones. Um, also, we were very surprised that the Hope Scheme model, we were ab able to get speed up uh, for both uh, ESO and FACE, um, since the, 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 the clustering coefficient is high, and of course for the power law um, uh, distribution, uh, of course, uh, the power law trees, uh, uh, this speed up is really pronounced, but of course, this is really tailored to our model. So uh, it's no surprise that we have such orders of magnitude on speed up. So basically, uh, what we wanted to push is the idea of uh, Given this a priori topological knowledge, uh, we can combine it with the generic, uh, general enumeration algorithm. And as a proof of concept, we show that even this really simple peripheral, uh, sub, uh, peripheral stars uh, can save a lot of computational effort. Uh, and of course, we provided you with some uh, reproducible evidence. And to summarize, basically what we want to do in the future is basically target more induced um, patterns on the graphs. Um, of course, we can generalize this concept of stars to be induced inside the graph, but also clicks and trees. Uh, we are really focusing on clicks at the moment because of the clustering coefficient, for instance. Um, generalize this to a directed temporal multilayer paradigm. Uh, for instance, the direct for a digraph is really simple since the lookup uh, is essentially you only need a lookup for the outgoing and the incoming uh, edges. So it's really simple. And of course, if since all of these um, lookups are basically for the peripheral case, uh, they are basically vectors. Um, it should not be uh, too hard to parallelize, parallelize this uh, framework. So that's something we are also investigating on the implementation side of things. So uh, these are my references, and I'll be happy to um, have your questions. Thank you very much, and sorry for the last <laughs> interruption. Yeah, so thank you, Miguel. And uh, again, apologies that, that we had to continue with the presentation in the middle. But I think no. given the circumstances, uh, you, you finished pretty well. 
So, Miguel, um, of course, the, the issue with, uh, with performance on dealing with large graphs is an important one, right? And, I, I mean, and I'm interested in that you're trying to condense the graph. But the question is uh, an issue of equivalence, right? So if I, if I generally, for instance, if I take a large graph, and you mentioned in the case of, of Facebook that you may want to find influences, right? So have you done experiments that the influences on the original graph, they remain the influences on the condensed version of it. Okay, so that's a very nice question. Uh, so you mean like, um, if you think about it, if you're thinking like about uh, undirected graphs with labels, um, although we didn't uh, target our experiments to in that sense, um, you only need to uh, save the lookups of the original properties. So uh, it's possible to retrieve the, the original labels if you save them intermediately uh, in linear space. Um, and any information pertaining to the graph uh, should remain the same as well, uh, if you're talking about simple graphs. Although we didn't implement it, um, I'm pretty sure that it's feasible. So in, in another curiosity I have is that, uh, so take, for example, a social network, right? So mm -hmm. we, we could have a sort of a, our lives is basically not one layer. You could, like many papers do, you could draw my, my connections from just work-related connections and then, mm -hmm. I guess, personal-related connections and so on. So if I take each of those layers and I actually do a condensation on the layers independently, if they all lead, uh, just as, again, assuming, to a same condensed version, do you know what <laughs> would that mean? So intuitively, as you, I'm not sure I'm making sense, but I was thinking, can we draw some conclusions when we have multiple layers and mm -hmm. we find that all of them go to the same condensed version, in a sense, or the same condensed structure or something very similar? Does this tell me anything about perhaps the need of having a multi-layer analysis or the lack of such need? Yeah. That's a very interesting approach. So, um, as I said, this is more targeted to the performance side of the algorithm. So, on an analysis side, if you condense the, the graph and you're saying like on a social network, if uh, you have different types of connections, if they lead to the same condensed version, I would say that uh, maybe uh, some um, intuitions can be gathered, but out of my head, I don't see uh, a motive why would we would need condensation for in that regard. Maybe there are other metrics that are already um, on multi-layer networks that already encompass that. But uh, I would say if they lead to the same condensed graph, that maybe it tells you that you have some pattern on your social connections, uh, that it's the same. But I wouldn't I wouldn't go for this strategy, to be honest, but it's something maybe we didn't consider. And out of my head, I cannot answer that question really well. Okay. No, no, no problem. So I was just mm -hmm. curiosity, I guess, mm -hmm. that yes. uh, I guess I have in terms of comparing graphs. And I was looking at perhaps this as, as a way to say, maybe I don't have to compare the graphs and tell that one is, is similar to another one, but maybe we can compare the actual condensed version of it. Uh, That's a good idea, worth worth investing. I would have to think about it, <laughs> but yeah, it's a good idea. I like it. All right, Miguel, thank you very much. Uh, so, you. Uh, so I'll ask you to to stop sharing if possible, and then we'll, we'll move to the final thank presentation. Thank you so much. Question. So, um, Mariana, you can try to see if you can unmute, unmute yourself and share the screen. Okay, we see a screen of the program of, but not of your presentation. Um, just a second, thank you. Now thank you, you may be able to see it. We see it. So thank you for, for being here. I'm sorry for the, for the delay due to technical problems. Um, so you have 15 minutes uh, and we'll follow up with questions. So the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Ronaldo. So good morning, guys. Uh, my name is Mariana Macedo. I'm a PhD student in computer science at the University of Exeter. Uh, our work explores the gender patterns in the urban mobility of the metropolitan area of Medellin in Colombia. So the evolution of cities, cultural constructs, job opportunities and technologies have been shaping our behavior. 
So division of roles in the labor market is one of many reasons why gender inequality exists. For example, women are underrepresented in top management and leadership roles. Our hypothesis is that those gender-rooted disadvantages can manifest themselves differently in mobility. For instance, in literature, we see that women feel unsafe, especially on public transportations. So some cities like Rio de Janeiro decided to create women-only passenger cars. This action was also adopted by other countries, such as Germany, Tokyo, Dubai. New actions like this should be adopted by our government to improve or try to improve any disadvantage emerged from differences on gender, race, age, income level, and so on. So those differences are not a new phenomenon. It's something that we can recall in 1885 with the Oracle of Ravenstein. He did the first attempt to formalize the human mobility patterns within a well-defined framework. And he actually highlighted that there were differences between women's and men's mobility. And for instance, he showed that women tend to make shorter trips than men. Of course, we have more works uh, exploring the gender differences in mobility, but the evidence are still uh, limited to some data sets. So in this presentation, we bring evidence from one more country to contribute to the understanding of universal patterns of mobility disaggregated by gender. So our data set was collected by surveys from 2005 and 2017 in Colombia. The interview households uh, explained their routines associated with the chosen mode of transportation, purpose of travels, and other characteristics. We also have uh, information of social demographic. So we, we know the gender of the person, we know the occupation, and we know the socioeconomic status. Each travel in our data set is composed of an origin and a destination. And a travel can be composed of one or more trips that are associated with each mode of transportation. As the example on the slide, the travel from zone A to zone B contains two trips that were made by walking and then by bus. So our data set is composed of around 50,000 people in 2005 and 30,000 30, people in 2017. The gender distribution is almost 50% of each gender. But as we can see in the, on the slide, the fraction of the travels are differently distributed based on occupation and purpose of travel. For instance, the number of employed travels increased over the years and the gender gap also increased. So we already can notice uh, some gender differences on the fraction of the travels depending on the occupation and the purpose of travel. So then now we can start to analyze the mobility differences of women and men depending on those two dimensions too. So, up to this point, we were talking about um, the importance of studying gender differences in mobility and the data description. But now we will try to explore some of the findings that we saw in the data set of Colombia. Our findings are only focused in our data and we cannot extrapolate our findings for all the countries yet. So our future goal is indeed to explore more data sets and other types of differences, such as socioeconomic and age. We will start now analyzing some characteristics uh, of the space, and then we'll move to temporal characteristics. Sorry. Okay. So first let's start with the spatial distribution of travels. 
On this slide, we can observe the area in which our data covers the metropolitan area surrounding the city of Medellin. Each point on this map represents one travel made by two respecti respective zones. On zones that have brighter colors have higher density of travels. We can see that the zones in yellow represent the visited zones by both genders, zones in red represent the zones that are mostly visited by women, and zones in green represent the zones that are mostly visited by men. So we can identify that the majority of the areas in the center of the map are visited by both genders, and that there are more areas in greenish than reddish. So we observe that men shows a more spatial exploratory behavior than women. In fact, in our data, men visit a higher number of zones than women, and the men's flow is higher than women's flow in almost 70% of the zones. So let's see if these change over time. So now I present to you the networks based on the orange in destination matrix from the gender mobility flows. Here we display the networks of the women's and men's mobility for three different periods of the day. The nodes represent the zones and the link between two zones represents the number of travels between those two zones. The size of the nodes on the slides represent the in degree. In different periods of time, we observe that some regions alternate the gender rate dominance, but the majority of the zones are mostly visited by men, regardless of the time. So now we will move to another aspect of spatial characteristics, which is the travel distance. So in 1885, Ra Ravenstein said that uh, women took shorter trips than men. And we also can see this fact being true even several years later for Colombia. So here, men visit more different places and they have higher flow and they actually have longer trips. And then women uh, take shorter trips and they also uh, tend to move within or in the proximity of the home zones. Now we are going to analyze another aspect of the spatial differences, which are how many modes of transportation one person uh, takes from a zone A to zone B, from the origin to the destination. So here I show that we, uh, we analyze based on the occupation and based on the demands, but for sake of this presentation, I will summary some of the main messages on the following slides. So actually what we can see uh, regarding how many modes of transportation or how many trips do I have to take to arrive to destination is that men tend to have single trips more than women and men tend to use the car twice much than women. So we observe that the usage of private transportations is indeed linked to the single trips of uh, women and men. Another thing that we can analyze is that women tend to use between three and five transportation of modes and women tend to walk and use public transportation. So even though in the literature, women tend to feel unsafe in the public transportation, for Colombia, women are the ones that are usually using more the public transportation. So now we will move to some characteristics of the temporal dimension. So each demand shapes the temporal signature of mobility in our sample. So now we can study what are the temporal differences of the fraction of the travels by each gender. On this slide, we can see it in the first and the third row, the fraction of the travels by hour. And in the second and the fourth rows, we can see the gender differences of the fraction of the travels by hour. So first, let's observe 
that the signature in the aggregated data set is not similar to each demand signature. In general, the aggregated behavior uh, shows a higher fraction of men's travels in the beginning and in the end of the day, and a higher fraction of women's travels than men's travels are observed in the middle of the day. Mariana, five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, then we analyze the three purpose of travels that represent together more than half of the travels, work, e-study, and home. They show accentuated peaks related to a business hours schedule, and men leave, to, leave for work one hour early than women, which can be related to the fact that men go farther than women. Moreover, we can observe that the study is the demand which displays the most gender balanced uh, fraction of the travels. Uh, finally, we can discuss some extra activity demand, such as uh, shopping, fun, and health, which shows a more diluted profile over the time. And specifically, we can see in shopping demand that there is, there is a shift on women's routine from 2005 to 2017. So now, as a summary, we could see some evidence on our data set from, of the differences between men and women. So women tend to have shorter trips, tend to move within or in the proximity of their home. They tend to use uh, several modes of transportation, mainly uh, they walk or they use bus. And men have longer trips, tend to visit more zones and tend to use single travels and tend to have higher fraction of uh, travels than women at morning and the end of the day. So finally, in general, we observe that occupation and purpose of travel are two key aspects to understand better and better not only gender patterns, but also general, uh, not gender patterns, but also general patterns. And our findings are in agreement with the recent paper using the data set from Chile. So our take home message is that the urban mobility of Colombia displays gender difference and we indeed can apply data driven analysis and frameworks to better understand the women's and men's mobility to help preventing inequalities that they, we suffer every day. So our current goal is to study other data sets to better understand the generalization of the gender differences regardless of the countries. So uh, I would appreciate to answer some questions and I encourage you to give us some insights and ideas for our next steps in this project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariana. So we, we have a question. Um that uh, I'm actually going to um, ask Marcus to come in. So, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Mariana, quite nice presentation. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it is just a, a quick question because I was wondering um, about the land use distribution in the city, the spatial distribution. Mm -hmm. um, so, would that explain? the male female differences because if this explain maybe now you can talk about ways of you know intervening the city so if i understood correctly um you are asking if uh the spatial distribution over the entire region uh is uh already an evidence to take uh some actions from the government um, I, I believe that we still have um, to study better the, the evidences in Colombia because our data set has, um, we only use the areas which we had uh, a consistent and robust number of travels. So we still have some uh, empty zones on, on the entire region to understand the spatial distribution as a complete uh, scenario. But what I believe it's interesting for Colombia is that uh, they have this concentration in the middle of 
the region. So they may have to uh, accommodate the mode, modes of transportation to be able to, to everybody access the, the middle of the country with the same um, equality. For example, women still feel unsafe to take public transportation and they don't know, uh, they need some actions from the government to feel better using the public transportation because they are the ones that are using the most. Uh, one, one evidence from, uh, from the literature is that if you put uh, guards in the, in the stations of the public transportation, you indeed decrease the crime against women. So there are some actions that are possible to, 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 to take place, but I believe we still have to study better the gender differences in mobility to actually have uh, co a complete idea on what would be the best ac actions for the entire region. Thank you, Mariana. So um, I don't think we have any other questions. I, I do have a couple, but since I participated on the work, I don't think it would be fair to you. So um, I will refrain from asking um, the questions. So I'd like to end here the session. Thank you everybody for, for joining in, thanking the people on YouTube. We will resume with session two, chaired by Ana Maria Jaramillo. Uh, at 1.50 uh, UK time, okay? So we will actually, I will start the Zoom session probably around 1.40 uh, just to make sure that people can log in. Again, thank you very much for con connecting uh, and participating. I hope to see you later. Bye-bye.